All right. We are in the book of Philippians. Chapter 2 is an amazing, 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 amazing. Did I mention amazing chapter? And um, the first four verses, as you see under our review, Walking Away from His Fortune, I didn't explain that title when I initially um, uh, utilized that as my title. It's about the kenosis of Christ, Him walking away from everything that He had a privilege to in heaven. Walking away from that fortune, there's never been a fortune like that fortune. He owned everything. If you own everything, you can't get more, can't have a greater fortune than that. And he turned his back on all that uh, to enter the human family. So he could keep the law of Moses, being deemed by the law as a a lamb without spot or wrinkle, and become eligible to be the sin offering offered to God for our sins. He was God. But still, he was put to the test in his 33 years before he died. He had to live a life without spot or blemish. Otherwise, he would be disqualified, just like the sacrificial lamb was disqualified if it had any blemish in the Old Testament. And so Jesus wasn't made righteous by the law, but the law proved him to be righteous. He never broke the law in any point, was found absolutely blameless. And I wrote a course that, uh, talking about he lived a life of holiness, instead of praise, it earned him death. And that's the truth, it earned him death. God Almighty in the person of Jesus Christ had to earn the right to die for my sins. And he gladly did it. And it's an amazing realization. So one day, what we talked about Sunday morning in verses 5 through 8, up there above that in a note I talked about what uh, verses 1 to 4 were about in in a very brief way. And then I reviewed... uh, um, our Sunday's lesson. And uh, verse 5 said, the attitude you should have is the one that Christ Jesus had. Uh, That's in the Good News Bible. King James said, let his mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Um, But I like the Good News translation. You should have the attitude of Christ, in other words. And... uh, in his pre uh, Robertson, a Greek, a Greek scholar, said some wonderful things on this uh, verse when he said in verse 6, Who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Robertson said in his pre incarnate state, when he was in heaven forever, before he stepped aside from the privileges of being God, never stepped aside from being God, just stepped aside from the privileges that being God allows. Before that ever happened, it said, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And um, Robertson said in his pre-incarnate state, Christ possessed the attributes of God and so appeared to those in heaven who saw him. Here is a clear statement by Paul, the deity of Christ. And then another great scholar, Vincent, talks about the word robbery in the King James Bible, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And he mentions that the Greek word rendered robbery means... Did I get some of that erased? Yeah, I just left part three in there. Um, It means the actual act of robbery. It means the thing robbed. That's the second definition that could be applied. Or in this case, the third definition the prize that somebody wanted to rob. 
and uh, a thing to be grasped or held on to. And that's what the word means here, the Greek word means here in verse uh, 6. Being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Uh, so what it's actually saying there, even though he was God, he didn't think it was a thing he should grasp on to, hold on to at any cost which cost would have been our damnation. So he didn't grab onto it and say it's mine. And again, I, I've often used this example over the years. I've seen Christians come to church in a sour mood because a visitor was sitting in their chair. Instead of being happy to see a visitor, they were mad that the visitor sat in their chair. How come? Because that chair was something to be grasped by them. It was a treasure to them. That's my chair. At my pew, whatever. Jesus had a seat in the Trinity and would not grasp onto it because of the harm it would do me and you. If he'd held on to that and refused to step back from it, we'd all been in hell by now. Bottom line. So, when it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, this is the example he's using. He possessed something you and I can't even imagine possessing. Gold and silver is nothing to him. He possessed eternity. He possessed heaven. He had authority over all the beings in heaven, except God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, which were co-equal with him. He had everything. And he said, now, understand, this was for an eternity he had everything. He was an eternal creature forever. And one day, when he let loose of his treasure, you heard me say it over and over, and became a small thing in a, mother, in a woman's womb that developed into a baby born in nine months just like you and I God did that and he came out of that womb a person surrounded I don't know how better to put it surrounded by time it was morning then it was afternoon then it was evening then you go to bed then it was morning never had that in heaven it's another limitation that he had never experienced before He'd seen it because he created mankind to go through those cycles. But he had never personally felt the strain of time. He was always an eternal creature. So anyway, he laid all that aside for me. Verse 7, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by becoming like other humans, by having a human experience. And again, we talked about that. There's a wonderful note there by Benson. You can read verse 8. And being found in fashion as a man. So now he is human in every way. He's still deity in every way. It's a mystery that you have to be God to do. Nobody else could do it. He was 100% God and 100% man. And so being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself. It became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. And we pointed out that the cross, I mean, it was dying on a tree. And in the Old Testament, it was a curse to hang on a tree. Jesus not only submitted to dying, he submitted to dying in a way that the law he gave cursed. In every way, he humbled himself. And why did he do it? Hebrews 12, 2, at the bottom of that review section, looking on to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. I wish those words would be branded inside of us. Endured the cross. Despising the shame. Jesus dressed in holiness despised the shame so why did he do it then it said looking on to the uh, before it says despising the shame looking 
unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross and despised the shame. And it said down at the right hand of God, he subjected himself to all that for me, for you. Again, last Friday, Kevin and Daryl and I were talking and uh, Kevin asked a question because somebody asked him, how do I know God loves me? And I said, read the gospel story. How can you not know that God loves you? Open your eyes and read it. You don't do that if you don't love us. So there's no question under the sun as to whether or not God loves you. None whatsoever. All right. Now on to this week's lesson. The next three verses, 9, 10, and 11. And we have one more lesson next Tuesday, because there will be no Sunday service. That will kind of complete uh, the first part of uh, chapter... uh, two and wrap it up nicely so we'll get to some other stuff next Tuesday night that's really good as well but verse 9 after it said in verse 8 being found in fashion of man humbled himself became obedient unto death even the death on the cross verse 9 wherefore because of that fact that he was obedient even unto death because of that fact God also has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. Now, the Greek word for wherefore means consequently, because of what he did. Because of what he did. Now, I want you to I want you to understand something. Jesus was God before this scenario began. He had a glorious name. Now, commentaries argue whether he was known as the Son of God prior to his uh, becoming man, being born a human through the birth of his mother, Mary. Some say he wasn't called Son then. I think you could argue the point he was, and not because he had ever been born unto God before, but because God lives in eternity and has always seen him being born. Nothing is new to God. So I think they had that relationship of father-son, which isn't the same thing as our relationship of father-son. In our relationship of father-son, the dad's got to teach the son. Mom's got to help out. There was no God Almighty, Father of all, teaching Jesus anything. He was in every way, according to last uh, Sunday's lesson, equal with God. He never had to learn anything. You could argue the first time that an eternal God in the person of Jesus Christ ever learned anything was after he became human. It said he learned obedience through the things he suffered. Now what does that mean? He was never disobedient. I always persist that there has never been an argument between God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, ever. I think their minds are somehow intertwined. They all think alike. I don't think the Father had to talk Jesus into giving his life for me. I think it's been eternal knowledge of the three that this was going to happen. So what does it mean he learned obedience? As a human, it was the first time he had to obey his father. Again, he wasn't raised like a human child. He's an eternal God. So he learned what obedience meant. He found out something about these humans he created. That sometimes when you obey, whether you're a soldier, attacking a fortress or whatever, you sometimes find out the hard way, the cost of obedience. And in wartime it can be severe. Just watch the news of Ukraine. 
It can be an amazingly high cost. Firemen running into buildings as their captain gives the orders. They learn the cost of obedience sometimes. Jesus learned obedience in the practical sense. He'd always seen obedience. He'd set up rules in the law of Moses about obedience. He understood the precept of obedience. But now he experienced obeying his Father, not my will but thine be done, and experienced the pain obedience can cause. So he had a human experience now. They viewed it throughout the history of the world. They sat in heaven and viewed the cost of obedience. But now that cost touched God. So, for the first time in eternity, when Jesus took on humanity, he went to school, so to speak. He began to learn some things by experience. He had learned them by observation, sitting in heaven and watching. But now he felt them as a human. So, because of all that, it said in verse 9, Because of everything he did, God highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. He had a pretty good name before he ever came. He was equal to God, the Father. There was no drop off from God to Son. Now in our family, there's a little drop off from Father to Son. But, uh, maybe not too much, I don't know. I'm in trouble with the mother now. But anyway, the bottom line is, well, there's some ways I think Jason's a chip off the old block. In other ways, um, he's his own man, which he ought to be by this time. My goodness, he's 75. But anyway, there was no drop-off between father and son, between father and Jesus. They were equal in every way. He had a high and glorious name. But when he went back to heaven, when he ascended back to heaven, now God gave him a more glorious name. Because of all that he was willing to do, all the pain he endured for our salvation as an act of obedience to his Father, because of all that, The Father gave him an even more glorious name. I want you to catch this. God has highly exalted him and given a name which is above every name. One of those names it's above right now is Father. Father God is a name. You say, what are you talking about? The Bible tells us in this dispensation, this church age, It pleases the Father that all the preeminence dwell in His Son. Father God wants me thinking a whole lot more about Jesus than about Him. Jesus said, when I go away, I'll send you another comforter. The other part of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. Another of the same kind. Remember I told you there's two Greek words for another. Another of a different kind, another of the same kind. The comforter that Jesus sent them when he went to heaven, the Holy Spirit, was another of the same kind. He was God too. And so, what did this God that Jesus sent when he ascended back to heaven come to do? Talk about Jesus. That's what Jesus said his job's going to be. To talk about me. To show you stuff about me. That's one area of Pentecostals get out of line sometimes. They want to center their attention on the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's job is to give my attention on Jesus. Why? Because we're in this time frame where the name of Jesus is exalted above every other name. Now that won't always be the case. We'll learn in Scripture. In 1 Corinthians 15, we covered it when we were in that epistle, that... uh, There's going to come a time when Jesus puts the last enemy under foot, death, that it's all going to go back to the Father. 
But right now, I talk about loving Jesus. Now, I love the Father. I love the Holy Spirit. But they're showing me Jesus. They're saying, put your attention on Him. And when He finishes and wraps everything up, things will go back to the norm, the way they always were prior to the incarnation of Christ. So, it says here that God has given them a name which is above every name. Now, where does it go? Uh, by the way, the word highway exalted in the Greek comes from two Greek words. It's a compound, uh, and it means to elevate above others, uh, raised to the highest position. Uh, and Robertson said, because of Christ's voluntary humil- humiliation, God lifted him above or beyond the state of glory which he enjoyed before the incarnation. So his glory was even greater when he got back to heaven than when he left heaven. And um, so in what way does his glory increase? Besides his humanity, what else did Jesus return to heaven with? At the bottom of the first side of your notes, Ephesians 4, 8, wherefore he saith when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Colossians 2.15, having spoiled principalities and powers, that's demonic authority. He destroyed it. He made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. By the way, there are Greek scholars, Bible commentators, will tell you their view on what that meant. That meant when Jesus descended, when he was dead for three days, into, I believe, into the paradise portion of hell. There was two compartments in paradise and regular hell that the first thing he did was went into hell and took away from Satan the keys to death and hell. And then he stepped over in the paradise, preached the gospel to the Old Testament saints that were in Abraham's bosom. And then, let me read on here. Something you only read in one gospel. Matthew. As we continue to explain what it meant, he spoiled principalities and powers. Jesus in Matthew 27, 50-53. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. Again, Jesus said, no man take my life. I lay it down. He died when he was ready to die. He just lived and he could have drove them crazy and refused to die. They could have poked him and poked him and poked him and poked him. But until he knew that he had finished it, and he cried out and said, it is finished, and he yielded up the ghost. But before that happened, again right here where we're reading it, he cried with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Now listen, you're not going to get this. And Mark, Luke, or John. Only in Matthew, the count. What happened with that earthquake? We all know from watching the movies about Jesus, that heavy, gigantic veil that covered that blocked the way from the holy place into the most holy place in the temple because man did not have access to the holiness of God. The day he was crucified and that earthquake came and ripped that veil in half. And Paul said that signified that the way into the holiness has been made available to you and I. We can go right in and talk to God any old time. And that's the good news. But it doesn't stop there. Verse 52, besides that earthquake, the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now get it, they arose the day of the crucifixion. Flip it over and see when they come out of the grave. Came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So God woke them up. During that earthquake, well, Jesus was dying. They lay there. You say, how's that possible? I just read it, folks. It's God. It's possible because it's God. 
they lay there for three days. Jesus had to be the first born from the dead. Not one of them got to come out of their graves until Jesus came out of his. And so, on that third day, um, after his resurrection, uh, many of them came out and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. Now, a lot of commentaries, I love commentaries, I'm a huge commentary man, but I tell you, I think they're copping out. They said that was probably people who had just died recently in Jerusalem, followers of Christ who had just died recently. I don't believe that. I believe they were the Old Testament saints that he had went down and preached the gospel to while he was dead. God had already made a way for them to get out of there with the earthquake opening the graves. They came to life after he rose from the dead. And when he ascended, they ascended with him. Now, I believe personally, and there's not enough scripture to verifiably prove this, but I believe it's not talking about his ascension 40 days later. Jesus was in the garden, and Mary saw him and rushed to him. Not Mary, his mother, the other Mary she's called. When they said, why do you seek for the living among the dead, when the angel told him? She left and she saw a man walking and thought it was the gardener or somebody and went and said, where have they laid him? And then she recognized him and was going to reach out and touch him. She said, don't touch me, I'm not yet glorified. I believe that day before he appeared to the disciples in the upper room, he ascended into heaven and poured his blood on the genuine altar in heaven to purge our sins. And I believe on the way up, he then came back and appeared to and spent 40 days with the disciples. But on the way up, I believe he took captivity captive. That's a military verse the commentators tell us. I believe he meant the demons in the interstellar area between heaven and earth he had taken them captive and was leading them to heaven and on the journey just like the Roman soldiers used to capture an army and they parade them through the street of Rome I believe on the way up he went up and they would uh, the stories about the Roman soldiers they would rip the everything off the uh, leaders of the army they conquered they gave them any authority stripes bars whatever in today's world whatever signified them as being a leader they were all stripped of those things I believe Jesus stripped the devil of all authority over his people that day humiliated them he led captivity captive the greatest day of victory other than the resurrection itself I believe Uh, It probably happened that same day. Again, his blood had to be taken up to heaven and poured on the real altar of God. You say, how could he recover his blood? He looked at nothing and said, let there be and there was. I don't think he'd have any trouble recovering every drop of blood he shed on that cross. And it had to be offered on the real altar, not the altar in Jerusalem. The real holy of holies, the one in heaven. And he purged our sins and the sins of all mankind who would acknowledge him as Lord and Savior. What a day that was. So, verse 10. After saying his name has been exalted above every name, it gives us the reason now. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. Easy to read version of that verse. God did this so that every person will bow down to honor the name of Jesus. Everyone in heaven, on earth, and under the earth will bow. And at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. There's a note by Vincent, hence the salutation is not at the name of Jesus, as by bowing when the name is uttered, but as Alcott rightly says, in the spiritual sphere, the holy element, as it were, in which every prayer is to be offered and every knee 
to bow. So everybody is going to bow their knee and confess Jesus is Lord. Every devil, every angel who will willing would do it. Every redeemed saint and every sinner before the great white throne judgment. All will bow their knee to Jesus and call him Lord. So, Colossians 3.17 under that, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. I wanted to share this about that verse. How many, uh, no, Daryl drove semi forever. Uh, you ever get pulled over by a cop when you're driving? Going through a town maybe in a traffic stop or something. And, and so here's Daryl in this huge truck, maybe with a heavy load behind him. And here's a little man in a blue uniform doing this. Daryl doesn't run him over. How come? That little man with his arm out is no match for Daryl's truck. Why doesn't Daryl run him over? Because he understands, although they don't utter it, that this means, in the name of the law, stop. And if you run over him... The entire community of the law is going to come down on you like you never dreamed possible. They don't have to say stop in the name of the law. You know that. We're supposed to do everything we do in the name of Jesus. It doesn't mean that every time we do something we need to say I'm doing this in Jesus' name. But it does mean we need to understand that it's in His authority we're doing these things. And that's what the commentator is getting at. Doesn't mean it's in the sphere of doing things. Doesn't mean you have to always mention the name, but you have to always understand where the authority lies. And so we have to do everything we do under the authority of Jesus Christ. And that includes, by the way, every word, every deed, but also in all of our worship when we give thanks to God and the Father. Through Jesus. Everything we do, everything we pray about should be done in Jesus' name. Again, whether we utter those words or not, as long as we understand those words. I can't even approach God except in the name of Jesus. Acts 14, verses 8, 9, and 10. And there sat a certain man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never have walked. Now this man was sitting at Gate Beautiful. Jesus would have walked by him several times and never healed him. Wasn't God's time, but all of a sudden, verse 9, the same heard Paul speak. Uh, oh no, I'm thinking of uh, Acts 3. I got to back up. This isn't the guy I was thinking of at Gate Beautiful. And there sat a man at Lystra, impotent in his feet, being a cripple from his mother's womb, who never had walked. The same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, Paul steadfastly beholding the cripple, and perceiving that he had faith to be healed. God said, he's getting it, Paul. He's getting it, Paul. Paul said with a loud voice in verse 10, Stand upright on thy feet, and he leaped and walked. Paul didn't say in the name of Jesus. But he did it in the name of Jesus. Now, I don't want you to think I'm diminishing the phrase. It is never wrong to physically say in the name of Jesus. But what's more important than physically saying it is believing that you're doing it in his authority. And if you're doing it, again, a cop doesn't have to come up to your window and say, I'm here in the name of the law, and you were speeding. You understand he's a cop, that he represents the law. He understands that you understand that. And the same thing is true in this. Paul didn't see a need to say, make a beautiful prayer and say, in Jesus' name, stand up. I think today's faith healers would always want to do that, especially with the cameras rolling. Maybe that's why we're not as good at some of that stuff as they were in the first century. It wasn't about cameras. 
It was about helping folk. And Paul said, stand upright. And the man leapt and walked. Uh, leapt. L, not W. And um, walked and praised the Lord for healing. So, we don't always have to utter those words again I mentioned after that. Um, but we have to understand our privilege to pray comes from the worthiness of Christ. We approach God Almighty based on the righteousness of Christ, not our righteousness. All my righteousness is a filthy rags. That will never change. I'm a Christian. And every good thing I do that emanates from me is filthy in the eyes of a holy God. The only works that I do that are acceptable to God are the works that His Holy Spirit prompts me to do. I'm doing it because God is telling me to do it or leading me to do it, however you want to word that. I'm just a tree. I bear the fruit of the Spirit. That's it can produce it I can just bear it nothing I can do but bear it and when it's a work of the Holy Spirit that good work is always acceptable to God alright so as we wrap this up Vincent said down toward the bottom of things in heaven and things on earth and things under the earth, the word may apply either to all, all intelligent beings or to all things. The latter is in accord with Paul's treatment of the of the creation collectively in Romans 8 and with the Old Testament passage in which all nature is represented as praising God, as in um, Psalms. So uh, I agree with Vincent that the words in the Greek could apply to all intelligent life everywhere, or to, intellig- uh, or to intelligent life along with all created matter everywhere. Uh, Paul said in Romans 8 that creation itself groans. The Bible says some weird things we're not going to understand until we get to heaven. When they were riding, when Jesus on Palm Sunday was riding a donkey into Jerusalem, Scribes and Pharisees were outraged that he was allowing all these people to put palm branches in front of him and say, uh, Hail, thou son of David. And they told him, Tell your disciples, I'll, I'll put it in my words, Tell your disciples to shut up. They said the, the phrase, Hold their peace. You know what Jesus said? If these would hold their peace, the stone. I don't think they're talking about a rock band here. The stone shall immediately cry out. There's stuff going on in the molecular I don't think we got a clue about. And I don't think we're going to have a clue about it until this thing wraps up. But uh, it said all creation groans for that day for the manifestation of the sons of God. Creation itself groans because it'll be restored to its original beauty groans for what's the manifestation of the son to God when God shows the finished product of what he's doing with his children when we see Jesus and become like him because we see him as he is creation is groaning for that day in Romans 8 not only is creation groaning, a couple verses later, we groan for that day. And a couple verses later, the Holy Spirit makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Not tongues, because tongues is an utterance. A lot of people in Pentecostal world want to make that speaking in tongues. can't be tongues. Acts chapter 3 said they spoke in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. In uh, Romans 8, the Holy Spirit is interceding for us with groaning that cannot be uttered. A lot of groaning going on here. Why is the Holy Spirit interceding for me? I don't even know how to pray for me. Some of the things I think of my strong points are my weak points. Some of the things I think of my weak points might be my strong points. But the Holy Spirit knows exactly where I'm at on this journey. And he intercessively prays for me with groanings. 
and God understands every groan. A lot of groaning going on in Roman 8, and some of that groaning is by creation itself. So we'll wrap it up with verse 11 at the bottom. Not only is every knee going to bow up there in verse 10, but in verse 11, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The word confess means, uh, in essence, to say the same thing. We're going to say the same thing that God says. Uh, Not only has this new glory that Jesus has ascended to, this new name that's above every other name, greater than the name he had before he became man, when he had been eternally God already, now he's Redeemer. And because of that, nobody will go to heaven or hell without bowing a knee and confessing that he is God. 